Throughout the month of February, Denver 7 has been celebrating Black History Month. In this Denver 7 special presentation, we're sharing undertold stories of African Americans and their contributions to our Colorado. We'll introduce you to Denver's unofficial mayor, Daddy Bruce Randolph. Then take you to the Old West, where black cowboys shaped cattle ranching and rodeos, despite racism and oppression. And later, we'll follow in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s footsteps, the impact he made on Denver's civil rights movement. But first, their recipes changed the barbecue landscape in Colorado and across America. A local grill boss introduces us to the black pit masters who made their way from the south to the west, bringing with them that mouthwatering slow cooked meat. You can almost smell it through the screen. Meat that's been slow cooked over the smoke and flames for hours, producing that fall off the bone style of cooking we know as barbecue. Boney's Barbecue in downtown Denver has been serving up delicious plates since 2005. I like to say we have no style, just a good fork and barbecue. I mean, I like it to, to I guess, more close to Memphis uh, style. This is everything I do is pretty much dry rub. Boney's owner and pitmaster Lamont Lynch's style of barbecue is pretty close to the cuisine's roots. What we think of as barbecue today is actually Native American in origin. Food writer Adrian Miller, also known as the Soul Food Scholar, says over time, plantation owners transformed the Native American style of cooking into Southern barbecue. Back then, barbecue was hard work, all right? It's not like it is now. So uh, basically, somebody had to dig a trench, somebody had to chop down all this wood. And enslaved African Americans were responsible for every step. You know, one thing to understand is uh, after emancipation, all of these African Americans who had been doing plantation barbecues um, as enslaved people, basically they become barbecues ambassadors. At least one of those ambassadors ended up here in Denver. This guy named Columbus B. Hill, He's from West Tennessee. Uh, he shows up in Colorado in the late 1870s in Denver and around that time. And pretty soon he's doing barbecue for thousands of people. Two notable barbecues that he, do, that he um, did were um, on July 4th, 1890, when the cornerstone for our state capitol building was laid. He did a barbecue for 25,000 people. And then in 1898, he does a barbecue for 30,000 people for the stock show. Now that barbecue did not have a good ending because it ended up in a barbecue riot. A barbecue riot. Okay, yeah. tell me more about that. Well, so the barbecue was really just supposed to be for 5,000 people, mm -hmm. VIPs with the stock show, but word got out in Lodo, which was the seedy part of town at that time, and so all these people showed up. So you got 30,000 people, only food for 5,000. What I love is that with all of this chaos around him, this dude is just chilling. Eating his barbecue. You know, his reputation did take a hit after that, um, but he comes back and he starts doing barbecues for uh, a lot of African American uh, institutions. Columbus B. Hill died in 1923, but his barbecue gatherings had a lasting effect in Colorado. Denver has a barbecue scene and we used to have a strong one, but we got away from it. So we used to be known for bison barbecue and also lamb. And up until the 1950s, uh, you would see newspaper reports about doing barbecue that way. Since then, we've had a lot of people move here from other places and bring their barbecue styles and that's really influenced Denver barbecue. So I would say we're a mix of Kansas City, Texas and the Deep South kind of all together. So we don't really have a strong barbecue identity, but I think there's some barbecue restaurants in Denver that are trying to create one. For the past 15 years, Boney's has helped shape the Denver scene with its brisket, spare ribs, and southern sides. Here we have some greens. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have some mac and cheese. And it's interesting now that a lot of people think of mac and cheese as an essential barbecue side. Yes. I don't know where you, you feel the same way. I do. Miller says just as Denver may not be a place that you think of as a barbecue influencer, African-American pitmasters don't get recognition for their contributions to barbecue, but black cooks especially here in Denver, have had a huge impact on that delicious style of cooking that we know, love. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Man, that's some good stuff. Well, you just heard from our soul food scholar, Adrian Miller. Adrian, why is it that black pit masters cooks get left out of the national narrative? Well, there's been an explosion in the popularity of barbecue since the 1990s, and there have been a lot more barbecue media. And unfortunately, the people who decide what stories get told aren't diverse or don't have diverse networks. So we just see a lot of African-Americans being left out. 
I know you're working on a book. We don't want to give too much away, but you, you'll discuss just the history and how black pit masters actually contributed to this cuisine. Yeah, because barbecue is Native American in origin. And before 1800, they talked about barbecue as cooking in the Indian manner. But by the time you get to the 1850s, almost all references to barbecue involve African Americans in terms of cooking it. So I want to show that story and just show the contributions and how African Americans were barbecue ambassadors. Now you and I, I know our viewers know, we had a little too much fun eating at Boney's. Um, one thing we both say we like is that smoky flavor. Give us some tips on the best ways to barbecue. All right, so I'm much better at eating barbecue than cooking it. <laughs> but in terms of cooking barbecue, don't use lighter fluid. Use like an electric starter or maybe a chimney starter to first get that fire going so you get rid of that chemical taste. Don't sauce until the very end, otherwise those sugars and the sauce are gonna burn. And in terms of eating it, don't wear a light colored clothing because if you have sauce on your barbecue, that might show up on your clothes. And um, just make sure that you're getting really quality meat when you're cooking. I feel like that wearing no light colored shirts, you have experience with that personally. Oh, yes, yes. I've had to retire a lot of clothing. <laughs> As a soul food scholar, what's your favorite type of barbecue? You've eaten a lot of different types. Right, so number one is Kansas City. And I think that's a function of growing up here in Denver. We were strongly influenced by Kansas City and Texas. I'd say number two is Memphis. And then I must admit, Central Texas is growing on me, so it's climbing the charts. Yeah, I think we were very honest in the story about there not being a huge barbecue landscape here in Denver. I think you did a great job outlining the history, um, but there are some restaurants other than Boney's. A few viewers emailed me telling me <laughs> there are more than one black owned barbecue joints here in Denver. Let's talk about a few of them. Right, so one is Winston Smoke uh, on Dayton and Holly uh, in the Arapahoe Village, and that's Winston Hill. He was a longtime figure here in the Denver barbecue scene. There's also a Hungry Wolf, kind of on the south edge of town. Um, there was a place called Brooks Catering. I think it's more kind of catering now instead of a, a full grown, blown restaurant. And then there are a number of, of food trucks, um, but those are the, probably the three that I uh, go to the most. And unfortunately, we've had a number of not just black owned barbecue restaurants, but black owned restaurants that have closed in Denver, the Denver area over the past few years. Right? Yeah, you know, running a restaurant is tough. And so that's part of the natural cycle. And then. Uh, unfortunately, in a lot of black neighborhoods that have been traditional black neighborhoods, they're gentrifying. And so mm -hmm. rising rates and other factors have led to these businesses closing on. But we have some soul survivors, as I call them, S-O-U-L, soul survivors. And so uh, hopefully they'll be around on the scene for a long time. All right. Last question before we go. We ended the story kind of talking about sides. Macaroni and cheese is a must have for me. What are some must haves for you? So I'm all about the potato salad when it comes to barbecue. So I'm thinking potato <laughs> salad. I like slaw and the baked beans. And then for dessert, gotta have some peach cobbler. Ooh, peach cobbler. What about banana pudding? Oh yeah, that's good. But peach cobbler is number one. All right, yeah. all right. I'll, I'll end us on that <laughs> note. But uh, right. thank you so much for joining us, Adrian. When we thank come you. back, a story about a barbecue titan who became the unofficial mayor of Denver. The story of Bruce Randolph and his legacy from the grill across the city. Welcome back to a Denver 7 special presentation celebrating Colorado's black history. It's a name you've probably seen or heard a few times throughout the Mile High City, Bruce Randolph, also known as Daddy Bruce. Here's the incredible story of how his restaurant helped feed a city. In Denver, his name is everywhere. Daddy Bruce was a legend in his own time. But outside of what's named after him, who is Daddy Bruce Randolph? He opened up a restaurant on the corner of, at that time, it was Gill Pen and 34th. This is what Daddy Bruce did. He gave back to his community. All of that is true, but to understand who Bruce Randolph, AKA Daddy Bruce, really is, we have to start two centuries ago in a different state. Daddy Bruce documentarian, Reverend Ronald Wooding says Bruce Randolph was born in 1900 in Arkansas. His grandmother was an ex-slave and according to history that she you know, raised him uh, basically and of course she gave him her spiritual guidance along with her secret recipe for barbecue sauce. He grabbed that recipe and went to live with his son in the Mile High City. He came to Denver in uh, the late um, 50s, well in his 50s at that time. At the time, Daddy Bruce was in desperate need of a new beginning. He had several failed business ventures, and even though he was past middle age, he decided Denver would be the place where he started over. He wanted to go back to his first love, and that was cooking. Reverend Wooding says Daddy Bruce's barbecue served as a gathering spot, a place to grab a quick bite, and a place to get a free meal for those in need. In his very first year, 63 years old, in 1963, 
he decided he wanted to be like Jesus and feed 5,000. In his lifetime, he was feeding over 30, 40,000 people just on Thanksgiving. It continued to get so large that, of course, the Broncos came out. Uh, Pat Bolin, the owner of the Broncos, would come out and help out. Which Reverend Wooding says led to Daddy Bruce traveling with the Broncos and feeding them as well. Over the years, Bruce Randolph's reputation for giving back to the community grew larger. To the point that in 1986, they named the street after him. So, which was 34th, is now Bruce Randolph Avenue. Daddy Bruce died in 1994. His restaurant closed soon after. But that wasn't the end of the Daddy Bruce story. It was actually the pinnacle. Not only did the Thanksgiving meals keep coming, but in 2010, a school was named in his honor. Bruce Randolph School Principal Melissa Boyd says Daddy Bruce's characteristics are literally spelled out on the school's walls. Our school values, uh, brilliance, respect, unity, character, and effort really exemplify who Daddy Bruce was. With Reverend Wooding's help, the school also is creating a Daddy Bruce photo gallery in the cafeteria after only having one picture of the legend for years. They wanted to do something creative with Bruce Randolph. Each caption will hold a piece of Daddy Bruce's life, giving the next generation the full story of a man who started life over in his 50s, used his passion for cooking to feed thousands, and whose name can be found throughout Denver. Now we have Denver 7 photographer Dominic Lee joining us. A lot of times you hear my voice, you see me. Usually the words that you're hearing I wrote, just like with the Daddy Bruce story, but it's Dominic who is the visual storyteller. Dom, this story just didn't have a lot of video. Talk about some of the challenges you faced and how you overcame them. Well, as a visual storyteller, we really want to bring the viewer like to the story. Mm -hmm. um, it can be challenging sometimes when it comes to creating digital media, getting the photography, getting the shots, getting the video. And so I wanted to take this story to a whole nother level. I wanted to bring our viewers to Daddy Bruce to meet who he was. And so a lot of the pictures that we use are actually from the archives that were posted in the cafeteria. Um, the challenges of, of creating a video can be sometimes limiting when it comes to the media that you're working with. And so with the Daddy Bruce story particularly, I wanted to bring our viewers to a point where they could actually f like meet Daddy Bruce in person. And some of those black and white photos were really, really impactful from the times like back when he had that restaurant open. And um, part of those challenges are creating media from times where you might not have so much media to work with. So we use cutting edge technology to edit some of those videos, put together some of those montages and graphics that you see. Yeah, I bet a lot of our viewers didn't even realize they weren't seeing a lot of video, they were seeing pictures. Talk about how you use pictures and, and just gentle movement to create that almost facade of video. Yeah, so really anything digital is useful to us. If the person that we're talking to has stills, great. We'll shoot them ourselves, we'll make them digital, we'll animate them, we can rescale them, we can do a lot of different things to make the video heartfelt for our viewers. One thing I thought was interesting, because a lot of times you and I aren't together to work on these projects, but you really wanted the viewer to kind of get a sense of Daddy Bruce's life coming to an end. So you sought out a place and it took yeah. a lot of effort. Talk about that a little bit. I actually wanted to go to the gravesite of Daddy Bruce. Um, it's in one of the largest cemeteries in Denver. It's got some of the most iconic um, residents of Denver's history that live there. And so I wanted to get down to showing our viewers where he was at, um, where he was laid to rest. And so um, I actually went out to the cemetery. It was a little bit of a challenge. I, I spent some time walking around the headstones to find it, but it's those moments that when we bring those to our viewers for them to understand where he may have had an impact in the community, and it kind of helps tell that story. Yeah. All right, well, Dom, you're an awesome storyteller. I can vouch for you personally. If you want to catch some of Dom's stories, Usually if you see me, Nicole Brady, Eric Lufer, this is one of the photographers helping put the video sound together just so you get a better sense of what's happening in our community. So thank you, Dom. Thanks, Michael. After the break, you'll hear untold stories of black cowboys and how they help shape our Colorado and pave the way for future generations. 
Welcome back to this special Denver 7 show. We can thank Cowboys for settling in this Western Territory and founding our state, but you won't see many images of black cowboys or hear tales of their role in shaping our Colorado. Here's their untold stories and how black cowboys continue to shape cattle ranching and rodeos to this day. Whoa. Whoa. On one of the coldest days so far this winter, Maurice Whoa. Wade is out on the ranch making sure his horse, Beer Money, is well fed. Everybody asks me, said, well, why are you name the horse Beer Money? And I tell them, I say, well, the only money you're gonna win in rodeo is enough money to buy a beer and a hamburger. Wade is one of the only black professional rodeo cowboys, and his story starts in a place much warmer than this. I was born in Mississippi, and my uh, granddad uh, owned a farm in Mississippi. Back when I was coming up, uh, that was in the 50s, uh, our heroes were Westerns. Years before, Wade went to fight in Vietnam and later started working for the government in Colorado. I used to pretend when I was a kid that uh, we rode stick horses. I don't know if you know anything about stick horses. He realized his pretend horse was a catalyst for something very real. I met a gentleman by the name of Henry Lewis. Uh, he was an um, old black cowboy uh, that had been around Colorado forever. Wade says growing up, he never saw a cowboy that looked like him. Unbeknownst to me, he was a, the first black cowboy, but I thought I was gonna be the first black cowboy. The first on the professional rodeo circuit. He roped calves and I used to go over and help him practice. So one thing led to another, and then I started meeting other people in the business, and the next thing I knew, uh, I had a rodeo rig, I had horses, and uh, I was roping. Wade says as he got more into rodeo life, one of his mentors, Lou Vasson, wanted to create a space for black cowboys to come together. Lou was at Cheyenne Frontier Days, and he never saw, he didn't see a black cowboy, so he did a lot of research with Paul Stewart. Uh, Paul Stewart was uh, the founder of the Black American West Museum. Mr. Stewart discovered that almost one in three cowboys was black, and that was one of the reasons why he started this museum. Since 1971, Terry Gentry, a volunteer docent at the Black American West Museum, says this museum has told the story of black cowboys and cowgirls. When slavery ended, it continued to be a vocation for quite a few African American men and their families. a hard life to live. And one that afforded these men freedom and a way to support their families. But to this day, a lot of their contributions go unrecognized. Well, unfortunately, we become invisible in a lot of different facets. But Gentry says the museum will always display their past accomplishments and continued success. And there are some local black cowboys that we work with now, such as Maurice Wade and uh, several others that just, you know, fill up our spirit. Wade's mentor, Lou Vassan's research paid off and he eventually found a space for active black cowboys to get together. Come on, Leon. The Bill Pickett Rodeo. Do your thing, buddy. As a result of the uh, Bill Pickett Rodeo, uh, a lot of black cowboys started coming out. Wade says his hope is that future black cowboys and cowgirls will see the rodeo and professionals like him. Whoa. And know that there is and has always been a place for them in this profession. To catch some of those cowboys in action each year, an MLK Jr. Rodeo is held during the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Dr. King, of course, helped start the civil rights movement across the nation, including here in Colorado. Still ahead, the people and places that played a role in Dr. King's fight for equal rights in Denver. Welcome back. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is known as the father of the civil rights movement. And while a lot of his work for equal rights focused on the South, he also came here to Denver to help those who were already doing the hard work of fighting for equal rights. Long before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s statue sat high on a pedestal in City Park, the man himself moved humbly through Denver, providing fuel to a fight for freedom that was well underway. Dr. King came to New Hope in 1956 during the Montgomery bus boycott. 
Bern Howard, the chairman of Denver's annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day Marade, says during a time when black people were treated as second class citizens, Dr. King came to town to help local activists confront injustices. He actually heard the very first time his favorite song that became his battle song. And that song is, if I can help somebody, then my living shall not be in vain. The last time Dr. King was in Denver, he spoke over at DU, and that was on May 17th of 1967. They burned crosses, turned over cars. It was a reminder to both of these local activists, Reverend James Peters and Bishop Asen Phillips, that hostility for the civil rights struggle wasn't limited to southern states. The Klan said, we're going to kill you. They called my house and threatened the kids and all that kind of thing. That happened in Denver. When I got to Denver, I thought I had reached paradise. I saw black folk with green grass and five points. I thought it, it was nirvana. Then I found out uh, here in Colorado, black folk couldn't live past High Street. Both men would lead local churches and the civil rights movement here in Denver. But their stories start in the Deep South, Peters in D.C. and Phillips in Mississippi. I had a traumatic experience. One of my uncles was tarred and feathered and drove down the street and uh, hanged it. So Phillips left Mississippi and eventually came to Denver in the 1950s, where he began organizing local demonstrations. And on a trip to Omaha, Nebraska in 1958, Phillips met the man who would lead the national movement. His name was Martin Luther King Jr. I didn't really know then how important he really was. Around the same time, Reverend Peters also met Dr. King. The first time I got to hear him was at the Vermont Avenue Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., where he was just spellbinding. Peters, who was known for leading New Hope Baptist Church for decades, was a follower of Dr. King's. Becoming one of Dr. King's lieutenants in the movement, even giving a speech at the infamous 16th Street Baptist Church. But what they printed was just an excerpt from my speech. Segregation is like pregnancy, Reverend James Peter said. You, the more it shows, the sooner you'll be delivered. Peters would work with Dr. King more than 50 times, and Phillips would work with him many times as well. Both marched with him in Selma, Alabama. Only person that actually died from Colorado in the march was not a black person, but was a Jew. They walked together with us in our struggle. Now in their 80s, Phillips and Peters remember their friend Dr. King fondly. These two and many others fought hard to make his birthday a holiday in our Colorado and to create the Marade, which Vern Howard helped grow to 85,000 participants just this last year. And these men are still in the fight for equality. When someone has a dream that you can afford to buy into, it becomes your own passion. You can't retire from passion. You can't retire from purpose. Whether it's Mississippi, Kansas City, or Denver, Colorado, segregation is just real. And to be honest with you, it's still real today. Denver's a great city, and we've come a long way. Reverend Phillips is right. We've come a long way, but we still have some distance to go. Black History Month may be over, but all year long, we'll continue to tell the stories of minorities and underserved communities who often get left out of the national narrative. For all of these stories and more, head to thedenverchannel.com. Thanks for joining us.